I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, if you like what I'm doing, click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going and again, thanks for listening. Welcome back, Street Rockers. This episode is with Brian Lloyd. Brian is a stand-up comic in the New York City area and also an indie filmmaker. In this episode, we talk about comedy and the New York comedy scene, as well as what got him involved in comedy and how it's going for him. We also talk about him being an indie filmmaker and his newest short film, Swipe Right, which is currently on the festival circuit. And finally, we talk about his contributions as a writer for the Gotham Sports Network, where he covers the Mets and the Jets. So enjoy, folks. This is filmmaker and New York City comedian, Brian Lloyd. Welcome to Fascination Street, Brian Lloyd. How are you doing this evening, sir? I'm fine. Uh, I know I was saying this to you uh, last night. I, I've been under the weather. I have the flu, actually. So that's been fun. It's pretty similar to what I imagine a juice cleanse would be like. But but it's uh, it, it's been eventful. I'll, I'll say that. Now, I'm not sure how the bodegas work in New York, but here... You know, in the real America, we have grocery stores that have um, a bunch of different kinds of soup. And there's a soup. It comes in a box. It's called Mrs. Grass Chicken Noodle Soup. And it is the best cure for what ails you. I usually make it and throw as much black pepper as I can stand in there. And then I eat the whole bowl all by myself, which is, I think, is like three servings or something like that. (laughs) And then... You know, if I'm being honest, usually I polish off an entire sleeve of saltines crackers uh, while I'm eating it, but it does make me feel better. So give that a shot if you're not feeling better by the end of this show. Yeah, the only thing I've really been able to stomach is soup, so I might as well try a might as well try a different one. None of the ones I've had so far have been working. <laughs> well, that sucks. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Yeah, it's all right. Could be worse. Do you blame it on the polar vortex? You know what? Yeah, m- might as well. We might as well just blame it on the polar vortex. I, <laughs> it, it's just been it's been like twenty degrees and then sixty degrees every other day. We'll we'll chuck it up to that. It, it can't be healthy for anybody. Well, the way I figure it, um, every time I get sick, it's because of a drastic temperature change. And you know, if you're talking a forty degree temperature change, that's a big deal. Yeah, it's been it's been annoying to say the least. I don't know how many hoodies I need to wear every day. I don't own a jacket, so maybe <laughs> maybe I should just get a jacket. <laughs> uh, you live in New York, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm in Queens. Um, shouldn't you own a jacket? It gets fucking cold there, man. Yeah, uh, you're not the first person to tell me this. Um, I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I mean, I, I have varying degrees of sweatshirts. I have a fleece. I have a, I do have one jacket I wear, but it's mostly just for skiing. It's a, like a big, it's like a big ski jacket. And I don't like causing that much attention on the subway. <laughs> it's a giant puffy coat. Not so puffy, but it is bright colored. It's, it's a bit, uh, not quite neon, but it's vibrant. That sounds gross. What color? It, it's blue. It's an, it's navy. And then it has a light blue. Most of it is just a very bright blue. And it's, it's not the most pleasant thing to look at. Gotcha. Well, thank you for joining us on Coat Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. So are you from, you said you're in Queens. Are you from Queens? Yes. I have lived in, uh, for the most part, the same part of Queens my whole life, and then spent some time away uh, in Pennsylvania for the last few years, uh, back and forth from school. But uh, yeah, Queens, New York, for the most part. Now, this is going to sound like a dumb question, but are you Queens Boulevard? <laughs> no, I I'm in uh I'm in a different part. I'm, I'm Bell Boulevard. No one's going to no one's going to get that reference. 
But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm not not Queens Boulevard. I actually don't watch Entourage either, which is uh, a little strange. I just never, I just never clicked onto it. But yeah, no, that's a different area and a very different type of person that would claim it in public. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I think it's it's all right that she didn't watch it. It's a little bit douchey, but uh, I still loved it. A douche and all. You're growing up in Queens, and you I guess you went to school in Pennsylvania? Yeah, I went to college in Pennsylvania. Which one? Uh, the University of Scranton. Well, that uh, makes a lot of sense. So uh, did, did you, from there, did you go to work for Dunder Mifflin? <laughs> Uh, no, but I did learn that a lot of the places they reference in the show are actually real, which was fun. Like poor Richards is a real place. A bunch of the restaurants are are actually there. Um, none of it was shot there, which is not surprising to me, but that's the number one question people ask me is, is if it was shot there, which I think is pretty bizarre, but yeah, no, it, it was one of those things where once I was there and spending some time there and got to understand uh, some of the people that live around there, even though it's mostly making fun of uh, the people, it just fits so well. And I know it wasn't even specifically like targeted to the people that live there, but it's just like Phyllis makes so much sense. <laughs> and like Creed, it just, um, yeah, it, it, it did make a ton of sense uh, once I got to spend some time there. That's really funny. One of the things about that show that kind of freaked me out was that that was the very first overt product placement that I ever saw. And it was for, a, um, did you watch the show? Yeah. Yeah, of course. So I guess I want to say it was probably midway through the second season, something like that. They did an entire show focused on a trash compactor, like a, a giant paper sort of cardboard compactor kind of a thing. And that machine, I found out from listening to a podcast about the show, that machine was actually like a, a product placement for that weird ass paper compactor. It was, it was very bizarre. The the Baylor, is that what they called it? Is that the the thing that Michael wanted to use maybe? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. They call it a Baylor because once you, you compact all the cardboard, we used to have one where I worked. So once you compact all the cardboard, then you bale it together like a giant bale of hay. And then somebody comes and picks it up and recycles it. But um, I, I just thought that was like the weirdest product placement, like overt, product placement ever and it was like an entire episode dedicated to that stupid machine and then also that was the first place that i ever heard about wikipedia so i'm pretty sure that was a product placement also what oh, i want to know if their sales went up that's like i want to know how many people went out and bought bailers after that but also what what how do you not know what, about wikipedia what year was this when it came out, was that season one or something? I mean, that was that was kind of a long time ago. It's still, oh, that is, that is, yeah. I mean, it's still in popular culture, but like when it was coming on, and I was watching, it, I was like, "What the hell is Wikipedia?" Like, I didn't even think I didn't get it until I uh, the yeah, next day at work. Like, I was uh, like, "Oh shit, it's real." I it was like two thousand three, two thousand four, I guess, when it started two thousand five, something like that. Yeah, so something it, like that. It, it is. It doesn't. It doesn't feel that old. I know because it's so it's it holds up so well and it's all over the place. You still see it and people reference it and I think they're supposed to be bringing it back or something. Yeah, they've talked about it. I I hope to God not, but at this point, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, they're just they're just bringing back everything. So, enough about the office. Thanks for stopping by office talk. Just kidding. So you go to school in Scranton, and what did you go to school for? What was the end game? Uh, initially it was, it was, uh, pre-med to be a doctor, which is hilarious. I, I went there cause they were a good science school. Uh, so I went in as a bio major, I did a semester and it was just God awful. So after a year I switched over to film production, which also changed about halfway through the main professor and the program changed a little bit while I was there switching from, you know, broadcast news style stuff, which doesn't really warrant much. I guess we'll say employment. It's it's a very specific and non-diverse way of learning media. And then that kind of switched over a little bit to independent filmmaking. Uh, so that's where I got my first taste of making some short films. I made a web series. Um, so I, I made some really cool stuff. And then while I was in school, in between you know stops in Pennsylvania, New York, I started doing stand-up comedy. So then it became... I mean, I don't really know what the end game is now, to be honest, but it just 
I knew I wanted to create something. I had some experience uh, with television production in high school, which was mostly an avenue to make some jokes with my friends uh, in front of a little audience. We had a closed television network that would do, you know, morning announcements, stuff like that. So we took that as an opportunity to make as many jokes as possible in front of, you know, our, our high school classmates for, I don't know, what, what it was like four minutes a day. And then once I was like, well, doctor, I would hate myself and I'd probably get a couple people killed. <laughs> I was like, this makes sense to me. Um, and I just, I started creating. So what drew you to comedy? What what drew you to try and get those, all those kids to laugh and to think that you could do it? Well, comedy always just made sense to me. It, it's pretty funny. I remember I was like, I, I don't know, I must've been like 14 and my parents were on the phone with some of our family in Ireland. And they were like, oh, like, what, what does Brian think he's going to do whenever and I was like you know as a joke I was like oh stand-up comedian my dad's like well you're gonna be hungry uh <laughs> and then I, I never really you know thought about it much but it was definitely the way that you know I made most of my friends throughout my life you know it was all the things I liked it was always you know laughing making people laugh um and then as I got older and started to you know try and understand the science of it and, and you know, the two things that I've always really loved as other things that have fallen to the wayside have been, you know, comedy and film. Um, so why not try and do it? I, I was plagued a little bit by the idea of if this is really what I enjoy, I, I can't not give it a shot. I will hate myself for that. I won't hate myself for failing. Um, and it's the same reason I'll probably never quit, even if I never, <laughs> even if I never hit. Never quit what? Being a comedian or being a filmmaker? I'd say both, um, but definitely stand up. It's the one thing that, uh, you know, you take a couple months off uh, for something or you take a week off and, and you get an itch. Um, I've never had that itch in regards to anything else um, I've ever done. You know, you miss it. You miss the platform. You miss the, the, the process, everything. You know, I, I'll have more fun performing in front of three people than I would doing, you know, anything else in the world for five minutes. Three people. Wow, you really love comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you have to get used to that uh, little PSA for anyone trying to get into comedy, especially in New York. Uh, there will be many a show for for about a table of people at 1130 at night. But, you know, you need the stage time, you need the spots, and, you know, you get better. You definitely get better in rooms like that. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a joke, but it's also not completely false. You make three people out of four at one table laugh, it's still, you know, 75% of the room. It's better than one table in a room full of 20 tables. Yeah, you, you learn a lot, and uh, you got to cut your teeth somewhere, right? So, Yeah, and I think that uh, you get more reps. Well, not more reps, but I feel like you get a, a faster education in comedy if you're making the one, you know, three quarters of one table laugh, because when there's only four people in that room, the room itself doesn't have the the jocularity if you will like the room is not just waiting to burst into laughter like if there's 20 full tables there so i think it's a lot harder and you mentioned cutting your teeth i think it can make your teeth sharper by performing for those you know empty-ish rooms absolutely there's no easy laughs in in rooms like that i'll tell you a, a quick little story the worst show I've i've ever done thus far I found out about the spot a couple hours before guy asked me to do a show at a hostel, which I, I didn't really know what he meant at first. <laughs> so I, I showed up and it was a hallway. Uh, I mean, I'm in, you know, my bedroom at the moment and my bedroom is bigger than the hallway. So it was, it was a hallway. I'm performing into a karaoke mic for four people and none of them are from the United States. And I'm doing bits about, you know, social media and millennial stuff. You know, I'm 22. So there, there was a good chunk of time where a lot of my material was based on that type of stuff. And these people are like, I don't know what Instagram is. <laughs> and then after a couple minutes, you know, the elevator dings and it opens right into the hallway we're in. I, I was doing like 12, 15 minutes for these people. It was, it was brutal. I was, I had a, one of my friends actually came uh, cause he's like, Oh, I haven't seen you perform in a while. I was like, well, I'm going to do this show tonight. And he's like, this sounds awful. 
Uh, so it was the best show ever. <laughs> 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 you got to see me bomb in front of these people that didn't really speak English. Uh, <laughs> so that that was a fun night. That was a fun night. That sounds like a blast. Doing comedy in the middle of a hallway with an elevator and a group of people who don't speak the language that you're that you're comedianing. That's funny as shit. I, I'll, the the atmosphere was definitely we don't know what's going on right now for the entire time. So instead of laughter, there was just confusion all over the place. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, my friend was cracking up, uh, and I mean, <laughs> I was having a good time. So it was, uh, it was all right. That's really funny. The last comedy show that I went to, I, I took my daughter. She's twenty seven to a comedy show that was at a local bar in the college town that she is living in and going to college. And the the comedian is a friend of mine and a previous guest of this show. And so I went to go see him. And you know, like I said, I took my daughter. And we got there, and uh, besides the three comedians that were in the bar, my daughter and I were the only two people there. Well, and, and the bar <laughs> and the bartender. And so I looked at my daughter and I was like, sure, I'm glad I brought you so I wouldn't be here by myself. And then once the show started, I guess the bartender decided that he didn't need to turn off the TV, which obviously that's always a cool thing. But on the TV, for some reason, there was no sound, but they were showing 1950s black and white porn. And Jeez. so... And so then I looked at my daughter again and I said, sure wish I didn't bring you. And I was just here by myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's one hell of a variety show. <laughs> yes. And, and so the, the comedians, um, I mean, they were there to make us laugh and us only. And they, they did a good job. So it was definitely an experience. Yeah, it sounds, uh, it sounds like something anyway. <laughs> oh, it was definitely something. So. You do stand up in and around the the New York City area, right? Yes. This is going to sound like a weird question, but uh, because I was just interviewing a female comic from L.A. a couple of days ago. Is there a lot of female comedians in New York City, like currently? I think there's just a lot of comedians in general. I I think that, I mean, I I do know uh, a bunch of female comics, but I, I think it's just more that there's so many comedians and it's a bit oversaturated that you know it does feel like there's a lot of guys at times but i think it's it might just be about more more guys are trying to you know get into it new york is one of these scenes where you can get up you know so many times with so many mics and stuff like that you know every day that you know i i think if there's that many people trying to get up on stage it just happens that i think there's just more men going for it I mean, I'm, not, I'm by no means an authority on this, but I, I would say that I probably see more men than I do women. But there are a bunch of female comics around. Yeah, that's kind of what I was going for was just kind of to see, you know, sort of at at the various shows, like kind of what's the makeup. I went to a show to go see that same that same comedian. And again, well, this time I took both of my kids and like there was it was like a um, I don't know, some sort of a comedy night or something. So there was like 10 comedians. And, you know, we got handed the list of the comedians' names, and we're looking down the list, and my daughter, she's looking down the list, and she's like, man, 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 man. Oh, Ashley, that could be a boy. I mean, it could be a girl. That's probably a girl. Man, man. And then she got to um, uh, Angel. And, and, you know, down here in, in South Texas, that could be a boy or a girl's name. And so she's like, okay, so maybe two girls out of these 10. So let's see what happens. Uh, Well, Ashley never showed up. No, Angel never showed up. So we don't know if that was a boy or a girl. Uh, And then the Ashley, it turned out that was a dude. (laughs) So (laughs) So, no porn. So that's progress. Yeah, there was was no porn at that (laughs) one. So that was cool. Yeah, yeah. It is definitely one of those things where I'd say at least shows that I'm on tend to be a little bit more. Uh, male dominated but if you look at you know lineups at clubs all around i i don't think there's necessarily a shortage of female comics and i i know plenty of women comics that are plenty funnier than i am that, i guess that's progress at least, at right? least from my perspective sure uh, you know that's my perspective anyway i'm sure there's people out there would that would disagree with me 
from the comics I've talked to, um, it seems to be trending in the direction that you that you're indicating that, um, yeah, there's a lot of dudes, but, you know, there's more and more women doing it all the time. So I think, you know, probably nationwide that's that's trending that way and maybe even a little bit more on, you know, on the two coasts, because that's that's where it all happens anyway. I mean, even the even the four years that I've been doing stand up, there's definitely been, I'd say, a noticeable increase at least in the amount of women i see so i i'd say that there is definitely a trend in that in that direction cool so i saw on your website that you do work clean now do you only work clean uh i mean for the most part it's more of a challenge on on my side you know when i, when I first started out uh I, I was doing this workshop with this guy who's become a, a bit of a, a mentor for me and one of his rules was, you know, to work a little bit clean. And I just kind of never dropped that. And I always went back to the idea of, you know, if you're going to do a, a TV set or this and that, you know, your material will be transferable. Um, but also as I've gone on, you know, I've learned that, you know, it's easy to drop an F-bomb and, and, you know, try and pick up a laugh that way. I find it a little harder. I need to focus a little bit more on uh, the words I'm choosing. And this is not, you know, to attack anyone that, is dirty. I mean, there's plenty of dirty comics that I love. It's just, uh, it's not my thing. And I try to steer as clean as, as possible. And I mean, that could change, but I, I don't think, I don't think it probably ever will. I know that you just explained that it's a little harder, a little more, it's a little more challenging to, to work clean. Um, particularly in New York, I'm assuming. So is, is it harder also to like get booked knowing that, like if the club knows that you're mostly going to be clean or all the way clean, is it harder to get booked that way? Um, I, I think it can be. Uh, it hasn't, you know, impact me that much so far. I'm still uh, definitely trying to, you know, meet more people and get booked as much as possible. But I have known people who have, you know, talked to me about how, you know, a certain booker wants to see them do clean material versus what they can do. So, in terms of, you know, from when I started through now, it's always been about, I'd like to remove as much unusable material, I guess you could say as possible. You know, I mean, you, you always have the idea of like a tonight show set, you know, you, you know, that clean. Um, but I have talked to some people that it has been a bit of an issue for them where they have an audition come out and they've specified, you know, about clean material and, they talked to me about how, you know, they have a lot of great dirty stuff, but, you know, they're a little shortchanged on, on what they they find acceptable. So it hasn't impacted me, but just from a few people I know, it has been an issue for them. Interesting. So if somebody told you that you had to work dirty, would that be a problem for you? I, I don't think so. I uh, My material definitely stays a little, I mean, to be a little redundant clean, but I also don't get into certain topics that, you know, someone might expect at a dirtier show. I mean, I do have some sex stuff and some stuff like that, but um, the stuff I lean on is pretty clean. Like I've been, just to give you an idea, I've been working on, you know, like a, a bit on Planet Fitness lately that's been doing pretty well and, and like stuff like that, a little more everyday stuff. But I do have some stuff that digs into that territory, so it probably wouldn't be that hard to just tweak it here and there and, and throw it up. Well, I think that probably your method for, you know, trying to work mostly clean, I think that probably help you when you're booking colleges and corporate gigs, right? And, if, you know, like you said, the, the TV show spots, I mean, unless it's on cable, uh, nobody really wants a, a dirty set on TV. So I, I think that, the, that those those avenues would be easier for you to to stroll down if, if you can work clean. So good on you, my friend. No, thank you. <laughs> How many minutes are you up to now as far as your set? Most times I, I get up, I'm doing somewhere between five and ten. I, I could push 25 to a half hour if I had to, but I'm pr not, not the most confident. Right. But yeah, most set, most sets I'm doing are a pretty strong five to ten. And then, you know, swapping stuff in and out. Yeah, if I had to dig into the archives a little bit, maybe do a little bit of rewriting, I could probably push uh, 25 to 30. Right. Well, that's awesome. That's great. So, you know, typically you're running right around 5, 10, 15, somewhere around there? Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, so, you know, trying to just work on that stuff and, and get a, <laughs> get the smaller sets as tight as possible. Sure. Tell me what the hell is a bad millennial? 
Yeah, so that was <laughs> that came out of you know, like I mentioned before, I was doing a lot of stuff on social media and, and stuff like that at the time, and I you know I was sending out a tape for submissions and and you know some of the places wanted bios, and I just found that a lot of the stuff, uh, especially in my tape, which was at the time my a my a stuff was very millennial centric, and you know me not being behind a lot of the trends and stuff like that. Like I have a bit about how I don't do any online dating. Like I I never have no Tinder, no anything like that. So it was just kind of about that, about how I I feel like I personally don't really conform to a lot of what my generation has adapted to and stride. I'm trying to, trying to be even better at it. I'm trying to cut down my, my screen time here and there, but it's, it's pretty difficult, but um, yeah, it's pretty much just not, sticking along to you know some of these trends like i'm not going out to dinner and taking a picture of my meal like i'm just not doing that i'm just not (laughs) i'm not gonna do that ever hopefully well that really sucks because um you know what i usually put out a picture with the episode and i was going to ask you if you could send me a picture of your food so oh well (laughs) (laughs) okay so now tell me about idiots without credibility what's that it is well credibility is a fun project. It's on hiatus at the moment, mostly because, you know, I'm pretty busy. I mean, we tried to get this uh, podcast episode done for a while. Um, and I've just been all over the place. And uh, my partners in, involved in that um, are, are busy as well, working on some new stuff. But it started out as a podcast, um, which eventually uh, branched into a website that sort of took a few different forms. So it definitely started out as just us trying to find our footing. You know, it was me and a couple of my buddies from high school who have done a few different varying things in comedy here. The, both of them don't perform, but uh, they've been involved in stuff, uh, writing primarily. And it just started as a way to get our stuff out there, uh, doing a podcast, um, writing some blogs, which started out, I guess, in, in sort of a bar stool type of vein and then sort of molded into more of an onion style satirical headline type of thing and yeah by by the end of our last run you know we were racking up some good guests we were getting some pretty good numbers and we just uh we fell off we didn't really have the time so uh that's something hopefully that we can uh, ramp back up in the near future and for a longer period of time but yeah just comedy podcast comedy brand uh we still do have some videos on youtube uh, some stuff we've written under the dirty bubble media banner so um, we do still have some some stuff. I'm cooking up some stuff to start on production in the summertime, more of a video based uh, content. But uh, yeah, we're working. Maybe a little bit of rebranding, but uh, we're working on pushing out some content. Hopefully by summer. Oh, fantastic! Where can people find the content that is out there on that on that platform under that name? Uh, Dirty Bubble Media on YouTube. Our website, idiotswithoutcredibility.com, is currently on private. That was a choice I made as we sort of uh, sort through what we're kind of doing with our stuff. But yeah, our video content is still available on YouTube under Dirty Bubble Media. The pot, old podcast episodes are still up on iTunes, Stitcher, everywhere except Spotify. So you guys can, can check out that stuff. N- not terribly active, but you know it's out there. And we do still have uh, short clips on Instagram at Idiots Without Credibility um, as well. Gotcha. Very cool. Thank you. Now let's talk about you being a filmmaker. I guess you changed your major a couple of times in college before you decided to, I think you said, to study short film. Is that right? Indie film. It was it was media production, but it, it sort of took shape as you know short filmmaking and with an eye, I, I sort of took an interest in independent filmmaking. So I sort of uh, tried to work it around that as much as possible. Gotcha. So how many films have you made so far? I have, I have one that's done and that's currently out for festival submission. I've gotten a couple back, uh, a couple uh, acceptances back. I got selected a couple days ago uh, for one. I was on a real mention at another. Uh, so things have been starting to ramp up a little bit in the last month or so. Uh, hopefully more to come. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that's not it. I have another one that's shot and edited. I haven't had the time to uh, do the final cut. That's not the first one is a comedy. It's a uh, it's called Swipe Right. It's about a 
a lonely college student who gets catfished by a non-speaking teddy bear. Um, so it's, it's pretty funny. It's sort of my commentary on uh, like online dating and, you know, contrasted with uh, people's expectations built into romantic comedies. It has a bit of a, a twist at the end. So that's done fairly well so far. Uh, I have a drama that, you know, I need to finish the final cut on and that'll be out to festivals. Um, there's been a couple more that I've worked on in varying degrees that, you know, I wasn't the uh, director or primary producer, so it's not in my hands anymore. But there was a couple more projects that I was pretty proud of um, that I acted in. I did some producing on. But yeah, I'm not in touch or up to date on those projects at the moment. If they do, they'll be, you know, on my website, on my social media, stuff like that. Hopefully they get done and put out there so people can see them. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's always the end game. That's the goal. Hey, streetwalkers. Well, you're not literally streetwalkers. But now that I've got your attention, I am Stephen O'Reilly, and I have a podcast called The Bar Star Podcast. And since you're listening to the Fascination Street Podcast, I think you should check out my show. It's just as interesting without all the famous people because Steve has connections that I just do not have. But if you dig podcasts about music, working musicians, and other random shit that I decided to talk about, based around music, of course, because that's what I do, I'm a working musician for the past 30 years, then you need to check out the Bar Star Podcast. You can get it wherever you get your podcast, on any platform, and make sure you check out barstarpodcast.com. Now back to the one and only Steve Owens and whatever the hell he was talking about. Uh, that film that you were talking about that uh, is sort of your, your take on um, online dating or whatever, did you say it's called Swipe Right? It is, yes. And unless I'm hearing things, did you say that he gets catfished by a non-speaking teddy bear? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you heard that right. That wasn't a... <laughs> That that wasn't a misspeak. That was that was accurate. <laughs> now, do you mean like an actual plush stuffed teddy bear, or is teddy bear some sort of gay slang I'm unaware of, like a polar bear or a, or an otter or something? That there's a two part answer to that question. Uh, one, <laughs> yes, it's it, <laughs> one, yeah, yes, it's it's a regular plush teddy bear. We ended up choosing a rainbow colored one because it looked best on camera. So that was an issue that I had along with one of the actors and my DP. Um, and we talked to a good friend of mine who helped out on the project as well. You know, is this something that people would have a problem with? And we, we actually asked around, <laughs> you think this is something that would catch some heat? So no, it is not a play on some sort of, uh, I guess, what would you call it? Homosexual trend that we're unaware of. Right. Like some, uh, I'll some, let them, you know, some yeah. <laughs> gay category designation or something. Yeah, I'll let it be known right now that it, it's just a pure coincidence. And we, <laughs> after the fact, we're like, I hope people aren't mad about this because it wasn't our intention at all. <laughs> it was just, it was the best stuffed animal that looked good on camera. This was last year, I'm assuming, 2018? Uh, this was shot in parts of 2017. And then I edited it last summer and then started going out to festivals. I started submitting last fall. Congratulations, America. We have gotten so politically correct that now filmmakers are terrified about what color the teddy bear in their <laughs> short film is going to be. Good Lord. Oh, sorry. Is that a short film or a, a full-length feature? Uh, it's a short. It runs about 11 minutes. And and most of my work thus far is outside of a web series. Um, most of my stuff has been short films. So I'm um, you know, working on a couple different projects right now that if I get done writing them and, you know, down the line, hopefully there'll be something a little bit longer, but for right now, it's mostly short films. That's what the time and resources will, uh, will allow me. That makes sense. Let's talk about those resources. Where does a fellow like yourself uh, get the finances for, you know, let's say an 11 minute short film? Well, I got lucky that I worked on it uh, while I was still in school. So I was able to uh, rent out equipment, that was at little to no cost uh, to me uh, and some pretty damn good equipment. I'll, I'll end that, but I've purchased some of my own equipment along the way. Uh, so I've been trying to build up a little bit of what I can use. I mean, we're pretty lucky in that the technology where it is now, you know, as, as long as you have the right 
ideas behind it you can kind of manipulate not the most expensive camera to look pretty damn good um i i also do have a day job as well i i work in content for a uh a kids content company so i i i have some funds coming in from that as well when you say a, a kid content do you mean like a children's television programming uh yeah, yeah it's, it's kids digital oh okay is that a name brand or is that a category? I'm unfamiliar with that term. Oh no, it's uh, it's like a category. It's in the digital space. Oh, okay. I just don't want to name no, drop. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't. I would have cut that out anyway. Is it like cartoons or is it like you know, sort of like along the lines of like uh, Sesame Street or something, where there's actual people? Um, it's a mix of both. We do a lot of licensing, so um, cool. Enough yeah, said. It, it, it's a mixture. Have you performed comedy outside of the state of New York? Uh, I have. I've performed a handful of times in Pennsylvania um, while I was living there. That makes sense. Do you think the crowds are different? I, I don't think so. I think it's it's more of an age difference. I think I performed for a little bit consistently younger crowds when I was in Pennsylvania, and they tend to, I mean, not not to fall into the cliche of like you know Seinfeld attacking colleges, but you know that age demographic definitely is less open to certain comedic ideas to the point where they'll just be dubs that don't make sense. I, I was even doing a few shows through colleges that asked, you know, that I cut certain jokes. They had me run my set prior to, to the, the gig. So I, I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest difference is less of a, um, at least in my experience, less of a regional thing. I mean, I'm sure if I got more into middle America, it would be very different, but age difference has been the, the biggest thing that I've sort of run into. The the schools that made you run your set by them first, were those like extremely religious schools? Uh, one of them was actually my school. So they, they were religious based, but it was less about that. And I think just more about just not bringing up certain topics. I had a, a fun story. I actually heard a few like he said, she said stories about the history of my school and how that happened. And there was a rumor going around that Chris Rock actually performed there before he was Chris Rock. And after sending out like a very clean tape, did like the dirtiest hour <laughs> of all time. So, yeah, I, I mean, my school was, was religious based. Um, I'm not sure how much of that decision, you know, influenced me or the other comedians on the show. But it is strange and, you know, disappointing that people are, you know, trying to censor material like that. So, like I said, I, I work, I work clean. So, like, nothing I was even talking about was, was bad you know it was just like don't do this it was very bizarre it was hot button issues not even I, it was just like you know don't mention this and it would just be like a vague sex joke it, it was very strange outside of that vague sex joke do you feel comfortable mentioning a couple of the topics that maybe you weren't allowed to discuss like in terms of jokes that they asked to cut or, or whatnot or well you said that there was certain things that you weren't allowed to talk about Oh yeah, it was mostly um it was it was mostly don't reference uh sex, drugs, alcohol. I had a couple jokes about, you know, smoking weed and they were like no go. So just kind of stuff like that. Anything that they thought insulted people or targeted specific groups of people, they they said no. I mean, I had a joke. It, it was a terrible terrible joke, but I had a joke about that had like a throwaway punchline about someone having MS and they're like no go. Which, to be fair, not a good joke, but um, their reasoning for cutting the joke just was like, oh, you can't mention anyone that has, you know, this condition. You know, it, it really didn't have anything to do with, you know, I wasn't attacking anyone with MS. It was just like, you can't really mention that at all, which is just, again, it's just strange and unsettling. Well, what better way to embrace inclusivity than to completely deny the existence of somebody based on <laughs> something that they have or has <laughs> happened to them? That's funny. <laughs> okay, well, as we're heading out here, Brian, is there anything that we didn't talk about or that I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? No, I don't think so. I think you know, I'd like to give a, a quick shout out and a quick plug to Gotham Sports Network. They're a, a website I work with. Um, I cover the New York Mets, New York Jets, but you know I know you're based in in Texas, right? But I if, am. If, if any of your listeners or or you or anybody happen to 
support or want to read up on New York sports, we have some great podcasts and great New York sports coverage. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, check out Gotham Sports Network at you know GothamSN.com. And yeah, we have we have a couple great podcasts that I appear on time to time, uh, especially our post credits podcast. Yeah, you know, we talked about <laughs> filmmaking and stuff like that. So we had some good Oscars coverage. You can check out my top ten movies and stuff like that. Now we didn't even get into this Gotham Sports Network. Tell us a little bit more about that. So obviously you're going to cover New York Pro and I would assume college teams in in, rand, in various sports. How did you get into that? Well, I'm a huge. A uh, huge New York Mets fan and a huge New York Jets fan. Um, I had a friend that was working with him at the time. He has since moved on. But about a year ago, actually, we ran into each other and started talking about it. And he was saying, you know, hey, we're looking to expand the coverage for these particular teams. You know, would you be interested? And, you know, he put a word out and it just sort of worked together where they brought me on. And I was able to create some content. And yeah, it just it came to, together pretty smoothly and pretty quickly. They were a brand that I knew about for a little while. You know, I, I think I like to think we've made a little bit of noise in the New York sports uh, media game here. And and yeah, it's it, it's been great. I, I've been I've been very happy with them. So the way that works, you said um, I think you said they were looking for sort of focused attention on certain teams. So are you like responsible for you know like specific teams, and you kind of only are um, I guess paying attention to or reporting on them, or are you just reporting on all of the sports? You specifically, me, I I'm New York Mets focused uh, for the most part. I also do some Jet stuff here and there, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty focused, and we all are for the most part pretty focused on one or two teams, which makes the coverage pretty focused, right? And it it's good. It's we we combine a pretty nice blend of you know, fan mindset with analysis as well. So it's it's a pretty good mix that, that you'll find, especially now with, you know, New York papers and everyone is like firing half their sports sections and, and whatnot's going on. So everything's a little crazy, but we have some pretty good coverage and I think we're worth checking out. So you said you, you are specifically responsible for the Mets and the Jets. Who's better? Oh God, they're both. Uh, I mean, the Mets right now, <laughs> hopefully they're better than the Jets. I, and I don't know what, three wins would equate to for a baseball team, I guess like 60 wins. Um, I think the Mets are going to be pretty good this year. <laughs> <laughs> I would have said the same thing last year and I probably say the same thing most years, but um, I do like their off season. I, I understand why people are down on it, but I like the moves they made. You know, people forget that with their pitching set, if they had an average, you know, an average offense last year, they probably won the wild card. So I think they improved in the right areas. I know they didn't sign Machado, but what are you going to do? Well, I mean, we can't all sign Machado, right? Yeah, there, there's 29 teams that didn't sign Machado. I think I think most of them are going to survive. <laughs> Indeed. So, are the Nets in Brooklyn? Is that still a thing? Yes. So they're still the Brooklyn Nets. So you got the Nets, the Mets, and the Jets. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's luckily hilarious. I stopped following basketball. At, I don't know, like years ago. I think Lynn Sanity was the last time I followed basketball. It's been it's been brutal. I mean, the Nets are supposed to be all right this year, but yeah, New, New York sports has been uh, has, has been not too great the last few years. Yeah, when's the last time that any of your teams won something? Was it the Giants with uh, Eli Manning? Yeah, yeah, twenty eleven, I guess. You know, I mean, the Yankees are in the postseason all the time. The Islanders have a great team this year. I'm an Islander fan as well. So um, hopefully someone wins something soon. And it, Oh, wait, what been, about uh, the Rangers? Don't the Rangers win all the time? Rangers haven't won a cup since 94, but the they went to – yeah, they had a couple back-to-back Eastern Conference finals, I want to say, and I think they went to – they went to a Stanley Cup uh, a few years ago. So they had a good stretch, too. They just never uh, closed the door. Gotcha close the deal okay well uh thank you for for stopping by uh gotham for that that update i i had no idea about that so thank you for bringing that up um will you hit that gotham website one more time gotham sn.com all right and uh you said there's uh, multiple podcasts available everywhere yeah everywhere um we just got uh added to spotify so you can check out our podcast network uh pretty much anywhere podcasts are found so brian as we're heading out, go ahead and tell everybody where they can find you on social media and then hit your your personal website, like your um 
I guess your filmmaking and or comedy website. And then um, one last time, I want you to hit that Gotham sports. Cool. Uh, so you can find me on Instagram at Easter underscore bunny underscore Jesus. Um, on Twitter at the dirty bubble six. I've been trying to change that handle to at Brian Lloyd. And every so often I will claim fraud on the guy that has that account because he hasn't tweeted since 2008, but they haven't given it to me yet, but they will one day. But for, for right now at the dirty bubble six on Twitter, that's where I do most of my social media stuff. Um, you can check out my website, thebrianloyd.com t-h-e-b-r-i-a-n-l-l-o-y-d.com for some updates on projects i'm working on i have a bunch of stuff i made on there um i don't really put much uh comedy shows or videos on there at the moment but that will probably change in the coming months and yeah and check out uh my sports writing and the rest of gotham sports network at gothamsn.com and where can we find some of your dirty bubble media on youtube just on YouTube, Dirty Bubble Media, there's some fan trailers up there. There's a great Game of Thrones fan trailer up there that actually, if you've seen Batman and Robin with Mr. Freeze, it makes him be the bad guy in Game of Thrones. So that was a pretty fun one. We have some parody, uh, you know, those like now this type of videos. Yes. We have some parodies of those uh, that uh, we're pretty proud of that are pretty funny. So yeah, it's on YouTube uh, at Dirty Bubble Media. That's pretty much it. Very cool. Now, which platform was it that you're struggling to get Brian Lloyd uh, and somebody squatting? Is that Twitter? That was Twitter, yeah. I, I looked uh, for at Brian Lloyd and I looked for at the Brian Lloyd, and they're both held by inactive tweeters. Uh, and Twitter doesn't deem that as much of a cause for just giving me their handle. Um, I've Googled it. It's worked for other people's for some reason, not for me. But I will. I'm determined. <laughs> and I will get that sooner rather than later. Well, in the meantime, have you thought about Lloyd with three L's? You know, people get so confused with just the two anyway that <laughs> I think it would throw everything off. The most common spelling mistake in my name is that people will spell it L-L-Y-O-D. And I don't understand how that makes sense because just speaking words, when does a Y ever, it, it just, that wouldn't be Lloyd. That wouldn't. Just sound it out. I, I don't know. That, that's just a little pet peeve of mine. You know, what's really funny um, about that is that in Spanish, two L's together makes a Y sound anyway. So, like, in Spanish, somebody would read L-L-Y-O-D as just yoid or yod. It'd just be <laughs> it'd actually be yod. Yeah, it'd just be yod. That's weird. Um, be yod. Earlier, when I congratulated America for making a filmmaker terrified about the color of a teddy bear, uh, I, I guess I should also say congratulations that we have a country full of idiots who can't spell Lloyd. Good Lord. Good, <laughs> good Lloyd. Yeah, it's uh, it's something. It's I don't know what it is, but it's, it's something. Oh, it's definitely <laughs> something. Brian Lloyd. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your hectic and sickly schedule. And thank you for walking down Fascination Street and letting me get to know you a little bit better. Absolutely, man. It was a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure was all mine, and you have a great rest of your evening. You too. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Bye. Hey, guys. This is Steve Owens from Fascination Street Podcast here with a very important message. I'm awesome. I bet you thought I was going to say something else, but nope. What's important here is that I am awesome. I started this show because I truly believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear those stories. In the short time I've been doing this show, I've interviewed actors, directors, writers, inventors, podcasters, musicians, pro athletes, Olympic athletes, actual war heroes, even a Bond girl and a luthier, whatever the hell that is, and of course, regular people. From people who wanted to be stars but never gave it a real try, to big company CEOs and people who got to meet their favorite president. I love getting to meet and speak with people who have a story to tell. I feel like everyone does, and it's my job to get them to tell it. You never know who my next guest will be. An Academy Award winning actor, a platinum selling musician, or your own mother-in-law. But one thing is for certain, you will be fascinated by their story. So come take a walk with me down Fascination Street. You can find Fascination Street Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, 
and of course, FascinationStreetPod.com. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.